All right, sections 22.3 and 22.4. All right, I'm going to discuss uh, sections 22.3, alpha halogenation of uh, aldehydes and ketones, and base catalyzed halogenation uh, together. There's a significant difference between the two when you use acid or base, and we'll take a look at that. So first, at 22.3, so you know where in the text to look, the general reaction is here, an R can equal alkyl, aryl, in which case they're ketones, or H, in which case we're dealing with an aldehyde. If you react those with a halogen, most commonly it's bromine and bromination under acetic acid conditions or again, are typical. Um, the other aspect is that we need a CH2 group here because we have to have an alpha hydrogen. So when we have this, under acid catalyzed conditions, then you will monohalogenate the alpha position. Okay. So we can look at something that might be useful this is a symmetrical complex and you have to be careful about symmetrical and unsymmetrical um, I've drawn the phenyl group in two different ways here because I want you to be able to recognize that there are four alpha hydrogens here but they're all chemically equivalent and so with acid catalyzed conditions Br2 and acetic acid, we can obtain good products, good yields. I guess we can say they're all good products. Of the monohalogenation compounds. Now, I'm going to skip ahead to the reaction. Uh, in 22.6 and then I'll come back to the two mechanisms. If we do a base catalyzed reaction what we're going to see is the haloform reaction with an excess of base. Okay, and our base in this case is just going to be hydroxide. So <clears throat> again we need um, alpha positions and if we have these, we will <clears throat> per halogenate so <clears throat> with base, unlike with acid, we end up replacing all four in this case that I've chosen to illustrate here of the hydrogens. So we would produce we would just um, per halogenate that. Now that's the typical base catalyzed reaction. Now the haloform version of this is when one of the R groups is a methyl. Then we get something very special that happens. Watch carefully. When we react this with X2 and excess sodium hydroxide, we react with the methyl group, but then it goes a step further. And we have carbon-carbon bond that gets broken and we make the halo form. So 
if X were to equal chloride, that would be chloroform. If X equals bromide, or bromine, it would be the bromoform. And you can do the iodo. In fact, if, it, if X can equal chloro, bromo, and iodo, if it's iodide, it's a qualitative test for methyl ketones because iodoform is a bright yellow crystalline solid and it will almost, uh, in just a matter of minutes, precipitate from solution typically. So that's the haloform reaction and we're going to look at the mechanism of that and the mechanism of the acid catalyzed process. Now why do we get the selectivity? Well it's going to come back to the fundamental difference between the reactions. In the acid catalyzed reaction, The carbonyl, since we're acid, and we have an acid catalyzed reaction, then we're looking for a base. And this carbonyl with no halogens is a better base than this carbonyl with a halogen. Right? Halogens make things into better acids, but weaker bases. So after we've put one halogen on, then this carbonyl is strongly disfavored to be protonated and then form the enol that's required. So let's take a look at this with a simple system. Again, taking the simplest thing so we can focus on the key elements. Under acid catalyzed conditions, we protonate, of course, reversibly. carbonyl. Now, when we have a hydrogen attached here, we can get enough of this equilibrium to move forward. But when this is X, now, the basicity of the carbonyl is such that we don't get any significant reactivity. So this, of course, will tautomerize so I'm going to take that X away now. So that's the equilibrium that when the halogen is present it doesn't go further so we have the enol, of course, whatever the conjugate base of the acid was, can pluck off that proton to get us to the enol. Now, we already know, we learned last semester, electrophilic addition to alkenes. This is just, if you ignore the OH, this is just an alkene. And I'm going to do this one with Br2. And so this is actually a very, very nucleophilic alkene because I can push that lone pair down from oxygen while swinging out that lone pair or pi bond and then breaking the bromine bromine bond. And that will produce let me put a line down through here to guide the eye. So we make the carbon bromine bond. Of course, we have the conjugate base around to pick that up. Of course, in this case, we would have made bromide. CB would be bromide. And that gives us. And the electron withdrawing effect of the halogen makes this a much weaker base. Now let's consider that. Why is that? So considering that acidity. The carbon bromine bond will be polarized positive on carbon, negative toward bromine. Now we already have a partial positive charge 
on the carbonyl carbon. We now have a partial positive charge here. And these together, particularly this one, strongly disfavor the equilibrium with H plus to produce Now with a formal full positive charge, that plus plus repulsion means that we basically, for the synthetic purposes, don't get any equilibrium to form here. And so we stay at the monohalogenated compound. But now, let's look at the base catalyzed process. base catalyzed process, we're going to see something that's fundamentally very different. Because the role of the compound here is different. When I put in a base, when I put in a base, what's the role of the carbonyl? It's reversed. It's now the acid. And so we're going to deprotonate. There's our three arrow rule, one, two, three, our rule of thumb, to produce the enolate. Now, if the enol was much more nucleophilic as an alkene, the enolate is even more so. And so it will react very rapidly the bromide. But now we have this again and if we have hydroxide present now that we've put the bromide on this is actually a better acid and so it will undergo deprotonation again arrow to communicate that it, this is going to more favor formation of the enolate. Of course that can react with bromine again. Bring the lone pair down. It's okay to draw it from the anion once you've demonstrated that you understand that. That will produce Br, Br, H, carbonyl, and I'm just going to say here, repeat, and we get to the tri-bromo substituent instead of a methyl group. So now what we've done, remember chloral back when we introduced aldehydes and we looked at their reactivity with water? Chloral hydrate was the trichloroacid aldehyde and it exists essentially 100% as the hydrate because of the electron withdrawing effect. So this is a very, very partially positive carbonyl and it will readily be attacked by hydroxide. And guess what it produces? produces a tetrahedral intermediate. Now, 
if the lone pair swings down and the hydroxide goes out, we just go back, and that of course is going back and forth all the time, and that's how we would exchange the, anion, the oxygens, for instance. We've learned all that chemistry already, and it's of course going on all the time. We, it doesn't stop because the primary product we're interested in is something else. But when this lone pair swings down, because of the electron withdrawing effects of the trihalo, it stabilizes the anion and the carbon can become a leaving group. Again, because of this specialized stabilization of the halogens. Of course, this is a kinetically accessible thing and that will instantaneously deprotonate to make the carboxylate plus the haloform, in this case, bromoform. And so we get the mechanism of base catalyzed halogenation that results in all alpha hydrogens being replaced. And if it's a methyl group, then once we get to this trihalo, this is so electrophilic that we actually get carbon-carbon bond breakage to produce the carboxylic acid. All right, so that's 22.3 and 22.6.